Today, we intend to speak to you about the thing called Nibbana or Nipana. Many of you have probably heard of the word Nirvana or Nirvana, which is a Sanskrit word. In Buddhism here, we don't use Sanskrit very much. Instead, we use Pali. The word Nipana is, means the same thing as the Sanskrit word Nirvana. However, this word Nirvana is a bit chancy or dangerous because it's very close to the word Nivarana, Nivarana, which means the hindrances, which are things that disturb the mind. And so the word Nipana is safer, it's less often misunderstood. But whether we call it Nipana or Nirvana, we're speaking of essentially the same thing. You've all heard some things about this thing we call Nipana and have some understanding and interest about it. However, there remain things which you do not understand completely. And so we will be discussing some further things which you ought to be greatly interested in. Nibbana is the highest thing in Buddhism. It's the supreme thing in Buddhism. However, almost all the different sects, creeds, and doctrines that have occurred in India have had some aspect or something they called Nipana or Nirvana. They've all had some kind of Nirvana. However, the meaning in each creed or doctrine or school can differ and is often quite different than the meaning we'll be discussing here. Today, we'll be talking especially about Nibbana, Nipana in Buddhism. Somebody described Nipana in an, a, a way that is both easy to understand and also correct. They said that Nipana is the sumam banam, the utmost goodness of Buddhism. All, all genuine religions, all the different sects and creeds and denominations in India and elsewhere have some one thing, something that is its sumambanam. For example, in Christianity, the sumambanam is to be with God, to be with God in the kingdom of God. And so Buddhism also has its sumambanam, which is nipana. Without Nipana, Buddhism would not be Buddhism. Or we could say that without Nipana, Buddhism would have no meaning or value. This is why we study the thing called Nipana as the, the essence or the heart or the goal of Buddhism. Without this, Buddhism would be meaningless. There's a very important matter which is commonly misunderstood. Many people think that Nipana means death, that Nipana is the same thing as death or that it occurs after death. This is a very grave and serious misunderstanding. If something is truly to be the sumam banam, it must be something that we can get in this very life, right here and now, in this present life. If we must wait for some other life 
then it can't be the sumam banam. So the sumam banam of Buddhism, nipana, has nothing to do with, with death. But this is a common problem. It occurs even in Christianity. The true kingdom of God is something that we can find in our own hearts here in this life. But there are many people who think that it must come after death. And so they have the same problem as those who believe that nipana means death or happens after death. And so there are some who must wait for the kingdom of God or nipana until after they die. This understanding is not correct. It's not proper and it has no benefit for human beings. So whether we call it the kingdom of God or the sumambanam or nipana, please understand that it has nothing to do with death. The same problem exists in both religions. There are some Christians that insist that the kingdom of God can only be entered in the afterlife or whatever they want to call it. They won't admit, they won't accept that we can enter the kingdom of God within our own hearts right here in this life. And the same thing happens in Buddhism. Those who insist that Nibbana comes after, after death. Let's be very careful on this matter and understand correctly that both Nibbana and the kingdom of God, if they are to have meaning and benefit for human beings, that they must be something that we can have, get, receive, obtain, experience, whatever, right here in this life, this present life, before death. Allow us to tell you in advance a, a little bit ahead of time so it will be easier for you to understand later that when one enters or penetrates or realizes Nibbana, then one at the same time enters the kingdom of God or is at one with God. When the mind is at one with God or enters the kingdom of God, then it realizes Nibbana. Please understand this now, it will help you as this talk continues. So many Buddhists <clears throat> think that Nipana occurs after death, that Nipana is some city or state or place, some wonderful city where we go after death. This understanding is both amusing and laughable and at the same time very, very sad and pitiful. The same thing happens in Christianity, of course. Those who think that the kingdom of God is some physical city or place or kingdom. When this understanding interferes, then people aren't able to realize that Nipana and the kingdom of God are to be experienced within each individual's own heart or mind when that individual is has correctly practiced Dhamma. This is a point we should all understand. All the various sects and schools that occurred in India in the Buddha's time taught that Nipana was something experienced within this very life, within the heart and mind in this life. They, the exact meaning of it may have differed. Some said that the experience of the first level of absorption or deep concentration was Nipana. Some said the second level of absorption, others the third or the fourth, or the so-called immaterial absorptions such as consciousness is infinite or nothingness or is, is limitless. And various deep 
levels of concentration were taken to be nirvana or nipana, but in all of these cases it was understood that nipana occurred within this life. The misunderstanding that nipana was some city or place we went to after death arose later. Another misunderstanding which is equally pitiful is one that is very common nowadays. There are many that that believe that nipana is something that is out of date or old-fashioned or something just for old people. Some even say that it's it's foolish or impossible nowadays. So there are many who have no interest in nipana because they feel it's old-fashioned or beyond what modern or something that modern man should not be interested in. This understanding is very dangerous. It seems that the same thing happens in Christianity where there are many people who think that the kingdom of God is old-fashioned, out of date, foolish, even even stupid. These two mis- these misunderstandings ought to be eliminated and gotten rid of so that we can be interested in the true nipana. And so we're going to pull these back into the present into our own hearts. We're going to we're going to pull nipana and pull the kingdom of God into our hearts right now in the present in order to understand, realize and have these most these highest things, nipana and the kingdom of God. There are many directions with, from which we can approach this thing, nipana. First, we'll look at the word in its literal sense. We'll look at the letter of nipana. When we take nipana literally, it has the meaning, the quenching of fires or the quenching of hot things. Anytime something hot is quenched, is cooled, That is the meaning of nipana. So in the physical way, if a physical fire is quenched, is cooled, we call that nipana. Or if the mental fires, the defilements of greed, anger, and delusion are cooled, are quenched, we call that nipana. But in both sense, whether it's physical or mental, we can use the same word. We like, we prefer this word quench. And so please listen to it carefully. The quenching of, of heat, of fire, is the meaning, the literal meaning of the word nipana. It might surprise you to know that this, in the Pali language, is a very common, ordinary word. It has, it was originally just a word that children and, and adults and everyone would use any time something hot cooled off or was quenched that was the word nipana could be used whether it was a physical thing or a mental thing this is the literal sense of nipana so a child might yell out from the kitchen that the fire nibanad mean the fire cooled down or went out or the child might call out that the soup has nibanad, meaning the soup has cooled down enough that we can eat it. The meaning of the word nipana is, has these very common, ordinary, everyday meanings that even a child would know and use. And so we can use it even for material, physical things. So we should To understand it, we should understand it in this material aspect as well. Or a goldsmith working with gold in his furnace, then when he took the gold, the molten gold, and poured it out, and then cooled it with with air or with, with water, that gold, that hot molten gold, would also nipana it would cool down. So we can use the word in this sense as well. 
or wild animals that have been recently captured from the forest, <coughs> animals that still are quite fierce and dangerous. When these animals are tamed or are trained until they become tame, when all that fierceness and danger has been cooled down, then we can say that these animals have been made Nibbana, when that the fire of, of wildness and danger has been Nibbana. We can use the word in this sense also. So in the literal sense, these various meanings we've discussed so far all come down to a cooling down, a quenching of fire or of heat. And we've used it so far in a physical, material sense. The meaning, the, the sense, the deeper sense of the word nipana, we can use it about the mind and about life. And so when, when one's life is, is cool, when one's family situation is cool, we can also use this word Nipana, when our life is, is free of problems and hassles and disturbances and annoyances, then we can say that life is Nipana. And so in this deeper sense, the meaning of Nipana is, is cool or coolness. When someone's life, when the mind is cool, as we have just described, this is called niputa, niputa, one who is cool or the cool one. Let us tell you ahead of time also that whenever the mind is free of any conception or emotion of I and mine, of self and of selfishness, then that mind is cool, is cool. But whenever there arises in the mind a thought or an emotion or idea or sense of I, of mine, of self, of selfishness, then that mind becomes hot. So when the mind is free of this heat, it is cool, it is nipana. And once again, the limitations of language make difficulties for us. So when we say cool, many people think that this is the opposite of hot. Real nipana that we're speaking of is not the opposite, is not the partner or the, the mate of, of hotness or heat. The cool of nipana that we're talking about has nothing to do with temperature. It isn't the opposite or the complement, the correlate of, of hotness or heat. And cool also, in this meaning, doesn't have anything to do with cold. If you were cold, really cold, well then you'd catch pneumonia and die. And that's not what we're talking about. The coolness of nipana is not the opposite. It's not caught up in any of the meanings of hot and cold and temperature. It's a different kind of cool. A coolness when the mind is void of I and mine and selfishness. So then we come back to the word void. Void that is void of positive and negative, of hot and cold, of all dualisms void that is above all of that duality. This is the real meaning of coolness. The real coolness is void. It has nothing to do with hot and cold or with positive and negative. In the Pali texts it's recorded very clearly that the quenching of the fire of raka, lust, the quenching of the fire of tosa, anger, and the quenching of the fire of moha, 
delusion. This is Nibbana. So understand coolness in terms of the quenching of those fires of lust, anger, and delusion. Now, let's start over and take a good look at the, the importance of this thing we're calling coolness or, or quenching. If we look at our own lives, we'll see that without the quenching and cooling of, of thirst, of craving, then we would either go crazy or we would die. All the, all the desires and craving and thirst and hunger and fears and worries, all these fires that are coming up all the time each day, if there wasn't any quenching and cooling of these fires, if they, all these fires were burning in the mind constantly, non-stop, then the mind couldn't take it and we would go crazy or if we didn't go crazy we would just plain die. This is pointing to the, the very basic necessity of, of nipana, of quenching in this meaning that the calming of all that desire and craving and thirst, that, that cooling, that quenching is necessary if we're, not, if we're going to avoid going insane, we're going to avoid committing suicide. So in just this very fundamental way, can you see the importance right here, today, right now, in your own lives of Nipana? So even if this quenching is just a little bit here and a little bit there, only very temporary or little Nipanas, little temporary quenchings, even so, it is still absolutely necessary for the survival of life. So, if you, if you can reflect in this way, you'll see that for all of us, the quenching of these fires is absolutely necessary. If, for example, hunger, if hunger went on endlessly, continuously, without letting up, without ever stopping, then we would die. If anger was a constant phenomena, continuous in our life, then we would die. Or even if love for our lover, if this love just went on and on and on without ever being quenched, then we would die. For all of us, our, the continuation, the survival of our life depends on, on quenching, on Nipana. If all these fires went on and on and on, we couldn't take it. So it's Nipana that sustains life. This quenching, this cooling, nourishes, sustains life. Without it, life could not continue. If you can see this, you will see how, how important Nipana is, even to those who have no interest in spiritual things. They still need it in order to survive. There are two types of quenching. The first is the quenching that happens by itself, and the second is the quenching that we have arranged that has occurred through our practice of Dhamma. All the things that happen within our lives will quench eventually by themselves. All the harmful or evil or hot things that occur in the mind, these will naturally quench by themselves. Nothing is permanent. So all these things will eventually come to a quenching, a cooling of their own. <clears throat> but sometimes if the things, if that doesn't happen soon enough, or if we have enough wisdom, we can, we can be aware of the possibility to quench these things through our practice of Dhamma. Please note the difference between the two kinds of quenching. We can study the meaning of Nipana right here, now, today, in our own lives. We can just take the ordinary experiences of our lives 
and use these as a way to explore what Nipana is. For example, when, when a fire goes out, just the very simple experience of seeing a fire, a candle, a match go out, in that we can see the meaning of Nipana in a very simple way. Or when we take a bath, when we take a bath, the water cools down the heat of the body. And this is an experience of quenching. Or when we sweat, when we perspire, the sweat coming out of our pores cools the body, cools that heat down. This is an experience of Nipana. We can use these very basic human experiences to learn, to get to know the meaning of Nipana. We can directly experience it in this way for ourselves. There are all kinds of these, these examples. When it, when it rains, we can experience the cooling that occur, occurs all over from the rain. Or when there is an illness, a pain or fever or something, when this goes away, we can experience that quenching. All kinds of different experiences that will occur in our daily, our daily life can help us to discover the meaning of quenching, of Nipana. But nobody takes the time to look. Nobody is interested in this thing called Nipana. And so they don't even look for it and are completely unaware of it, although it's happening constantly in our own lives. So take the time to pay attention to the, the little, these very simple experiences of Nibbana that are occurring in all the things around us and in everything that arises within our, our minds. We can use all of these in order to discover the meaning of quenching. In brief, we can see nipana or quenching in everything. All things that arise, all things that are caused, that occur, all things that are born will eventually quench, will eventually nipana. For this reason, we can study this quenching in everything. All the various things that arise eventually will quench. In Pali, the words are yankinchi sumutaya tamang tapantang nirota tamang, which means all the things that arise through causes will also will will quench. And to see this is to see dhamma. When we can start to see this quenching, the cooling of all conditioned things like this and all the things that happen within our lives, when we, be, when we see this quenching that occurs within all these things, then we begin to see Dhamma. The eye of Dhamma, the spiritual eye, begins to open as we see all this quenching happening everywhere. And when, we, when this, the eye of Dhamma the spiritual eye begins to open, then we begin to understand the Dhamma. And so in all the everything, everything that you could possibly see or know or experience is an opportunity to begin to see this truth of quenching, to see this, <clears throat> this fact of Nipana. And if we begin to see this, then the spiritual eye begins to open. And as that understanding of Dhamma grows, it is through this that the spiritual path develops and reaches fruition. Whenever you see the quenching of something, then you ought to see Nipana in that thing. Whenever you see something quench, you ought to see Nipana. Whatever it is, no matter where, in anything where you see quenching, you, you should see Nipana. If we can study Nipana in all the things that are happening everywhere, anywhere, all the time, 
then we will start to understand the true meaning of Nipana. We can begin with the little, the little things, the little quenchings that really don't have that much meaning or significance. But then we can explore more and more deeply so that the understanding of Nipana becomes more and more deep, more profound, and gets closer and closer to the, the true Nipana. That is the most significant thing in human life. So using all the different possibilities, all the different occurrences of quenching within our lives, we can study the meaning, the significance of Nipana. So, so take the opportunity of all these little Nibanas that occur every day. Study them more and more until the, the understanding and experience deepens until the point where we have a sincere desire and need for the, the, the highest, the most complete, the perfect Nibbana. Please don't be careless about these little quenchings that occur each and every day. Just because they're small doesn't mean they should be overlooked. These are the starting point of our understanding. So we should be very careful to observe these little Nibbanas, the, the momentary quenchings that are occurring all the time. And then to study these so that our understanding grows and becomes more correct, more profound, until we develop a, a very earnest and sincere desire for perfect Nibbana. So use these small opportunities that nature is giving you now in order to develop towards the, the more perfect Nibbana. Mm. So if we observe in the way we have been describing and come to see that it's these little Nibbanas, these little quenchings that sustain life, that nourish life, that cool life, that allow us to continue in life. If we, if we start to see this, then we will genuinely appreciate Nibbana and we will start to to love, to actually love Nibbana, this thing that allows us to live. And then we, our desire, our need, our want for Nibbana will grow and grow until it becomes very sincere and earnest. So use these little opportunities to allow our, our love and need for Nibbana to grow. And so that we will then apply ourselves fully to the, the higher methods which will un allow the, the realization of per perfect Nipana. So now we have now we have studied the little Nibbanas sufficiently understood the this basic level of Nipana well enough that we can begin to develop this understanding to expand it, to broaden it, in order to come to a realization of the, the Nibbana which is complete, which is full, which is, which is perfect. So please take this beginning level of study now and expand it towards a deeper realization. Please study this matter very, very carefully. The first thing we need to, to understand is what we call dukkha or tukkha, suffering, mental suffering. If we don't understand this thing called tukkha, then it's hopeless, it's impossible that we would ever understand nipana. So let's begin by understanding what is meant by, by tukkha, suffering, so that we can also understand nipana. As we said earlier, Nipana is the quenching of dukkha. But if we don't know dukkha, then how are we going to know that quenching? Or if we don't know what dukkha is, well then what? there's no meaning. There isn't any real quenching for us if we don't understand what dukkha is. So then, let's look into the matter of dukkha. Let's explore, examine the dukkha that is occurring the suffering that's happening in our own lives today and every day. 
in our normal daily lives. In order to understand dukkha sufficiently, that we can also understand the quenching, the nipana of that dukkha. So we can, in every day, there are all kinds of little dukkhas, little experiences of dukkha happening over and over and over again, all the time. These little experiences of dukkha are happening over and over again. And so there are a lot of these little things that are dukkha, that are suffering. And so we can get to know these. In Pali, we call these in Thai the ni wan. In Pali, the ni warana, which is that word that tends to get confused with nirvana. Nirvana and ni warana are quite different. The ni wan, we often translate as the hindrances. You'll start to understand what we mean as we describe them. They're these little things which disturb and annoy the mind, which pester the mind throughout the day. The first of these is we can is the feeling that kind of flows in a, a sexual way. It's a sexual feelings or sen- feelings of sexuality. And these are, if you pay attention to these, you'll see how they excite and disturb and annoy the mind all the time. And when the mind is being pestered by these sexual feelings, how, how cool is the mind? Can the mind be cool at all? For the mind to be cool, these sexual feelings have to be quenched. And so this is the first example, the first of the nivarana. The second one is dislike, aversion, ill will. It's when we don't like anything. We don't like this, we don't like that, we don't like this person, we don't like that person. It, this feeling becomes so, so stupid that we don't like anything. We don't, we don't really know what it is we don't like. There's just this feeling of dislike, of aversion. When the mind is being pestered like this, annoyed by this feeling, it's not at all comfortable or peaceful. But when this, this feeling of dislike is quenched, then the mind is very much at ease. It's, it's cool. This is the second of the nivarana, the, the feeling of dislike, of aversion. The third of these is when the mind is weak, dull, when the energy level of the mind has dropped, when it's, the mind is very low in energy, it's not very bright, it's kind of dull, dim, weak. When the mind is lacking in energy like this, then it really isn't able to do any work. It doesn't, it's lacking the freshness, the brightness that we need to do anything. And so the mind like this is very lazy, very very dull. It has no, it's very dim. This includes also when the mind is drowsy and sleepy. All these feelings uh, in the mind which are tied in with a weak level of energy. When the mind is lacking in the strength, the brightness, the freshness, the sharpness that it needs to, to function properly to do the various duties of life. This all makes up this third Nivarana, when the mind is dull, weak, dim, drowsy, and so forth. You need to get to know this thing as it really exists. It's not good enough just to write it down in your notebook or to think about it, but to examine this as it arises in your own mind all the time, even maybe right now. Get to know it as it really exists, and then you will be able to start to to see how it quenches as well. The fourth one is the opposite of the third. It's when the, the energy in the mind is causing the mind to scatter, to disperse, to reek out. It's a bubbling, bouncy, scattered, distracted mind that's bouncing all over the place, running all over the place. When the mind is dispersed, and distracted like this, it's unable to think, it's unable to work, it can't do anything 
properly because its energy is, is going off in all directions. This is something that, of course, is occurring to all of you constantly. And so it's time you got to know it and really study what it is like. So the fourth of these is this dispersion, this distracting, this scattering of the mind and its energy. The fifth nivarana or hindrance is uncertainty. Uncertainty or doubt or suspicion. It's when we're uncertain about our own, about what is happening or what is right, when we're uncertain about whether what we're doing is correct, where we sit there and think, is this right? Am I doing the right thing? Or, or is, my, is my life correct? We have all kinds of doubts like this. Am, is what I'm doing right? And when we are thinking like this, then we are never contented. There is no contentment. And these doubts and suspicions and uncertainty arises about our life. Is our way of life, is our life really safe? Is it really healthy? Is it, is it really correct? We're, we're being disturbed by these doubts and uncertainties all the time. And so our life is never really at peace. It's, it's happening in your own minds, whether you've taken the time to look or not, it's happening. And so it's much better to observe it in the reality of the thing and not just the sound or the letters of the word. So now let's take a look and see what it would be like if all of these things were quenched, if all five of these hindrances were quenched, what would be like what would that be like? If all five were completely quenched, so in, in one moment there were none of them at all, then Nibbana, Nipana would appear, would manifest automatically, spontaneously by itself. When all five of these hindrances are quenched, then there is nothing but nipana. The mind is, is cool, is quenched. Now, if we want, we can just let these things quench by themselves, but that may take a while, and we may not be able to put up with all the, the hassle and discomfort while we're waiting. It's really not enough to just wait for them to quench by themselves. And so we need to do something about them. We need to quench them through our own practice. There are various methods for doing so. And this is why we practice mental cultivation. This is why we train and develop the mind, or one of the reasons, in order to quench these, these little fires or hindrances. Through the correct practice of, of concentration or tranquility meditations, through the correct practice of things like anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, through these, using these mental development techniques and methods, it is possible to quench these nivarana, these hindrances. And then when that happens, there is an experience, a little temporary experience or taste of nibbana. These little nibbanas are the result of correctly practicing mental development. They're, and within them is the correct meaning, the real meaning of nibbana, even though it's just little nibbanas, not the, the perfect and complete nibbana, but still it has the same meaning. An interesting thing about these nivarana is that they can arise without any external concern encouraging them or stirring them up. It's not necessary for there to be some external object of these, these hindrances. You can observe this easily sometimes when you're in bed about to fall asleep, where these nivarana will just come up from inside us without any real objects being there to stimulate them. They can just come up from inside because their, their causes are internal. This is a very interesting thing about them. Exactly 
how that happens we'll discuss at another time but you can see how these nivarnas these hindrances can happen without any external object and when you understand this you'll see how how easy it is for them to occur and how that they're happening so often these nivarnas are just little things little disturbances and annoyances of the mind which bring about little bits of dukkha it's it's dukkha it's suffering but on a very low level it's annoyance and that because they're coming from within it's not it's not any big heavy duty thing because they're just arising from within and there isn't necessarily an external object so we also need to move on and examine the the stronger the heavier suffering that arises from the defilements the defilements are much stronger much more destructive and bring about much more torment and suffering than the little nivaranas the nivaranas are like half half grown or half complete but the the gilesas the defilements are are full blown they're very powerful so we need to study these as well because they bring about much suffering in our lives we've already talked about them before so you should understand them already we'll go into them just a little bit the first is raka or lopa it's it's wanting desiring to get into hold and clutch and 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 hug and all that that's the first kind wanting to pull in grasp to bring in that's the first kind greed and lust the second is tosa hatred and kota anger this is the opposite it's wanting it's disliking wanting to knock away wanting to get rid of wanting to destroy and then the third is moha it's where we don't know what's going on at all we're confused we're deluded and it's like the mind running around in circles so there's the pulling gathering sweeping in there's the pushing and knocking away and then the running around in blind confused circles these are the three kinds of gilesa these are big heavy things now that are happening if we're going to understand nibbana we need to understand these aspects of dukkha so take a look at these things as they occur get to really know them if you don't understand these defilements then you'll never understand nibbana so please pay attention to these defilements and then you'll be able to get an idea to to imagine what nibbana is when we say to know and understand these three defilements we mean to experience to have a a direct personal penetrating experience of these things that means when they happen really feel it not just think about it or remember it a few minutes later but really experience it and when you have this direct and penetrating experience of these three defilements you'll see that they're fires experience how hot how burning these things are and then when you experience that then you'll see how when those fires don't exist when they have been quenched then you'll you'll see how cool how peaceful how how right nibbana is if you don't understand these fires these defilements it's you'll never have any clue about nibbana you nibbana is the quenching of dukkha so we have to have a a very full a very clear understanding experience of these defilements they're happening anyway so why not just ex- see what they're like and get it over with so that you can understand what's even what's better the the quenching of these things the coolness of nibbana there's an other another aspect of of dukkha which nobody ever talks about they they don't talk about this thing it's maybe because it's it's very profound or or very subtle 
but we'd like to talk about it now. There's the, the, what happens whenever these defilements, whether lust, anger, or delusion occur, whenever they happen, they, after they have passed, they build up each time they contribute to a, a familiarity with these things or a tendency for them to happen again. Each time a defilement occurs, it builds up the tendency for that defilement to reoccur. This, these tendencies pile up, they build up in the, the depths of the mind or what we could maybe call the substratum of the mind, the basic, the foundation levels of the mind, these, these tendencies develop. And so it becomes easier and easier for the defilements to occur because they're, these tendencies become deeper and more set. These patterns solidify. This is a, very, a much more subtle thing and so it's often not talked about and people don't pay much attention to it. But to understand dukkha, we have to understand how this aspect of defilement works as well. It's more subtle, but you can see how it happens. This, these tendencies building up within the, the depths of the mind, we, can, we call the anusaya, anutsaya, or in Thai, anutsai, the tendencies. This is something that deserves our very careful attention. We need to, <clears throat> I've been instructed to find a very easy word that's easy, easy for you to understand and remember that carries the meaning of a familiarity that returns very quickly or very easily. Meaning once the mind is familiar with a particular defilement, that defilement returns or is, is re-caused very easily, very quickly. These are kind of hab habits of mind, but I think the word tendency, these tendencies of mind, captures the meaning sufficiently. That once the mind, each that mind becomes more and more familiar with each defilement, then that defilement occurs more and more easily. It returns more and more easily. This is what we can call the tendencies the anutsaya. Now as we build up, as we deposit and pile up these, these tendencies, they build up a pressure. They, as all this gunk, this junk is deposited in the mind, it starts to bubble and ferment and it builds up a pressure. And as this pressure builds, it's very easy for that pressure to escape, to, to flow out, to shoot out. And so if, if there's any external concern or object, for, then it will shoot out in a complete form as lust, anger, or delusion when there's an external object for it to shoot out at, to flow out at. When there's no external object, it will just kind of ooze out, seep out, or bubble up as the nivarana which aren't as full or complete as the defilements, but are still suffering nonetheless. This is a very important secret of what's going on in the mind, how these tendencies pile up and bubble away, ferment away, all this gunk and scum festering in the mind. And then if there's, it either shoots out at the external objects or kind of bubbles up as the hindrances, the nivarana. Now when the, when this, this fermenting in the mind shoots out at a specific object, we call that the asava. The asava is when that pressure shoots out, it bursts out. That is that flowing out of this, that junk, that filth in the mind is called asava. If, when it first occurs, if it's primarily stirred up by the object, we call that gilesa or defilement. But when it's more coming out of this 
these tendencies within the mind bursting out. We call that asava or the outflows. So these are aspects of what's going on in the mind. We need to understand all of these aspects, the, the nivarana, the hindrances, those, those more subtle, incomplete, more vague feelings. Then the, the full-blown, the full-form defilements of greed, greed and lust, anger and hatred and delusion. Then the tendencies, the anusaya, anusaya, that build up in the substratum of the mind, and then that shooting out, that flowing out of the asava. If we understand all four, nivarana, gilesa, anutsaya, and asava, then we will completely understand what we mean by fire. When we, this is the aspects of the fire that's burning the mind. <clears throat> These nivarana, the hindrances, although they're small, they're happening all the time. And no matter how small they are, they're still hot, they're still suffering. And then the, the defilements, they don't happen as much. The nivarana are happening all the time. The gilesa, defilements, aren't happening so often, but when they happen, they're, they're heavy and they're really hot. And then there's those anutsaya where we we store up that heat so that it's, it's ready to shoot out, to, to bubble out, to burst out. And so there are, there's these aspects of all this heat, all this, this fire. Please, 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 please understand what these things are. What? Understand, get to know really deeply, completely, perfectly what Nivarana is what the hindrances are, what gilesa is, what the defilements are, what anutsaya is, what the tendencies are, and what asava is, what the outflows or cankers are. Please, please really get to know these really clearly, profoundly, and completely so that you will be able to also understand nipana. So we come to dukkha or tukkha. The meaning of dukkha is, is very broad, but it always comes down to torment. The meaning of dukkha can be summarized as torment, some aspect or another of torment within the mind. This is dukkha. So these hindrances, these nivarana, how do they torment the mind? The Gilesa, the defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion, how do these torment the mind? The anutsaya, the tendencies, how do they torment the mind? These, these things that make it so easy for defilement to occur. None of us want to feel greedy. Nobody likes to be angry or stupid, to be afraid, to feel lonely. We don't want to feel like this, we don't like to worry, but because of these tendencies it's so easy. It's just because we've built up this familiarity, these habits, patterns in the depths of the mind. It's just so easy to get angry, easy to be afraid. It, it just happens so easily. Can you, how does, how does this easiness, this tendency torment the mind? And then those, the asava, that flowing outward which becomes defilement again, that flowing out that turns into either anger or, or greed or fear or worry, whatever. All these things that are tormenting the mind, burning, scorching, singeing the mind. Get to see what this is like, to really understand this dukkha of all these fires burning and scorching, tormenting the mind. All of these are associated and interconnected. And so why is it that we can't control ourselves? Why don't we have any self-control that we don't fall into all these ugly, negative things that nobody, nobody likes? It's because they're interconnected and so we've, we've 
filled our bags with the anutsaya. Our bags are full of these tendencies. And so we're unable to control ourselves. These things, some people think, just happen. But it's, it's because they're interconnected. So we, we suffer. We we experience dukkha because our bags are too full, are too stuffed with these, with these anutsaya. But there's something we can do about this. Once each defilement has occurred, it's, it burns the mind. But what we can do is by practicing correct mental development, both concentrate of the concentration type or the concentration aspect along with the the inside aspect that sees into the reality of things through correct mental cultivation, especially mindfulness of breathing, what we do is we we poke a hole, we punch a hole in this bag and then drain off the tendencies. Instead of building up the tendencies more and more, we, we siphon them off, we drain them off through this hole that we drill with concentration and insight. And so that bag that is stuffed full, that is overstuffed with anutsaya, with these tendencies, the bag becomes less and less full. And as it empties, there's less and less of these, these outflows. When we talk about abandoning the defilements, this is what we mean. A defilement that's already occurred, there's not much you can do to abandon it. But we prevent further defilements. This is what we mean by abandoning them, by draining off the tendencies. Then this lessens the possibility of further defilements. And as insight deepens, as the understanding of Dhamma deepens, that hole becomes bigger and the tendencies drain out more quickly. And so the defilements arise less and less. This is the quenching of the defilements, we quench these anutsaya, and then we quench the asava, that shooting out, and then the, the defilements and the nivara, the hindrances, are quenched as well. Whether it's to the level, this just through correct practice, this continues, if we do mindfulness of breathing correctly, this, this draining off of the tendencies develops further and further whether to the level of sotapana or sagatakami or anakami or, or arahant, whether the stream enterer, the once returner, the non returner, or the, the perfected human being. These are levels where the defilements have been drained off more and more and more, where suffering has been quenched more and more. So the quenching of all this dukkha, of any aspect or in all aspects of dukkha, this quenching is the meaning of nipan or nipana. This is, this is the most important thing in Buddhism. We encourage you to, to remember these Pali words. The meaning of the Pali words is, is very special, very concise, and we you're better off if you can remember the Pali words and learn their complete meaning. Because when we translate them, much of the meaning is lost. It's much easier to understand the Dhamma when we learn these Pali words because they're, they capture the meaning just right. They're, because that's what they were created to do. Whereas once we translate them, much of the meaning falls apart. So. For example, the word tuka or dukkha. It's much better to learn this word, to take the time to learn the word and, of course, its meaning instead of translating it because the word suffering doesn't capture the full meaning of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness, dissatisfactoriness. These translations are only partial and so they're insufficient and they'll be an obstacle to you understanding these words, the meaning. So, so learn the Pali word, learn the word dukkha, because it means much more than suffering. We can, for example, there are three, as, three basic aspects to dukkha. 
The first is the tormenting of the mind, the, the experiencing that tormenting occurring in the mind. That's the first aspect. The second aspect of the word dukkha is the characteristic or quality of, of tormenting, of torment that exists. This is the second aspect. It's not exactly the same. And then the third is that which leads to, that which brings on torment. Dukkha. Dukkha has these three aspects. So it's best to learn the Pali word and its complete and correct meaning. For example, if we say this rock is suffering, you'll think we're crazy. If I say this rock is suffering and we speak in this way, nobody will understand. But when we say the rock is dukkha, if you understand what the word dukkha, then you'll know that we mean this rock here has the quality of dukkha within it. And so if we attach, if we cling to this rock as my rock, or I am this rock, or it's my rock, then that is dukkha in meaning in the sense that it brings on dukkha. So there's dukkha. Something is dukkha, or it has the quality of dukkha, or it brings on dukkha. When we say dukkha, it has, can have these different meanings. You have to understand them all to be able to understand the language of Dhamma. This complete quenching of Dukkha is the meaning of Nibbana. To have a full understanding of Nibbana, we must have the full understanding of Dukkha. So it's something is Dukkha, it has Dukkha. It's an experience of Dukkha. It has the characteristic of Dukkha and brings on Dukkha, leads to Dukkha. So it all comes down to that Nipana is the quenching of the heat of Gilesa, and that's enough. So please pay attention to Nibbana. Be interested in it as the thing that cherishes life, that nourishes, sustains, supports, cherishes life. That without Nipana, life couldn't go on. This is what allows us to live, the quenching of these fires. This, this is Nibbana. We, we hope you'll be very interested in it, pay careful attention to it, because this is where the story ends, with Nipana. So the story ends. <laughs>